as I was reading the knowledge gap last year, um, but before I would do that, we'd have our you know cuddle reading time in Nina's room, and we were reading Little House in the Big Woods. That's been such a fun experience as a mom to reread some of my favorite childhood books with her, and and Nina and I were were like really into it. She. Um, she was referring to herself as Mary and her younger sister as Laura, and she was calling me Ma and my husband Pa, which was really funny. He was like, why is she calling me Pa? Um, and when we had lots of conversations about children being seen and not heard, this was a new concept for her. Um, well, it didn't really sink in so much. Um, but I'll admit that about halfway in, and, and, and then I you know, go a couple hours later and, and, and dig into the knowledge gap, I was realizing, I'm not real, we're talking a lot about the story, but I'm not actually using this book as a launching pad for really good conversations and learning with my daughter. And so one Saturday we went to the library and um, got three books on um, pioneers and Wild West history books, and she brought them home. and. I tell you, the light bulbs that go off, it's so cool to see. You know, like, oh, that's why it's a big deal for them to go into town. Or, oh, that's why they're storing food for the winter. Um, and, and it's just, it has really opened up the reading experience for us. And, and that's, what, um, that's what we're going to hear about today. We have to keep remembering why, why are, what are we getting towards with this reading? You know, we're not just, can they sound out on a page, but it's this love of knowledge and learning. Um, so, so thankfully, Natalie's book caught me just in time, and maybe Nita's little sister will um, benefit from this mommy work in progress. Um, but I'll say Nina and the children across Charlotte Mecklenburg schools, um, as well as in Guilford County and Wake County and I bet other districts who are here today um, have something else going for them and that's a knowledge rich curriculum. We're in our first year in CMS implementing EL um, and I know that there are um, other districts across our state who are in various stages of this process. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased to um, bring Natalie up because she really has helped me realize why that curriculum change was so important. It didn't really crystallize until I read her book. And um, Natalie Wexler is, is not only a talented storyteller, uh, but she's a knowledge builder. So it's apropos that she, she wrote this book. Uh, we are also going to, she and I had a, uh, a chat. I said, let's try and leave room for two questions this time. <laughs> We got one on the other one, so, so we are going to try and leave some, some room. So be thinking about what you want to ask her. With that, I'll bring Natalie up. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Johanna, for that introduction. It reminds me of uh, Doug Lamov, who some of you may have heard of told a very similar story about reading Little House on the Prairie to his daughter and realizing she'd understand why it was a big deal that they were taking a bath on a Wednesday, because she didn't realize that they only took baths once a week on the weekends. And, um, but uh, first of all, I'm really delighted to be here. And um, I thought I would start by uh, telling you a little bit about how and why I came to write the book, The Knowledge Gap. Um, and it really started, well, about 10 years ago, I got very interested in education because it just seemed incredibly important, and specifically in what is often referred to as the achievement gap, the gap in test scores between kids at the upper and lower ends of the socioeconomic spectrum. And that is a gap, as you may know, that has been incredibly stubborn and incredibly wide. And I wanted to figure out What's the problem here? Why have we made no progress by some estimates in 50 years? Um, and in some estimates, we've actually been backsliding. And there's evidence of that on the latest results from the, the NAEP reading test. Um, and so I would go, I was both um, involved in the education reform movement in Washington, DC, where I live. And there was a lot of activity there. I was on the board of a charter school. I was also, I started writing about 
education in DC with a particular attention to the, this gap in test scores, because I had a background in journalism. And there was a mystery I wanted to solve. And the mystery was this. So we would go in groups often to different classrooms to see model classes. And we'd go to elementary school classrooms, and things looked pretty good. The kids were engaged. The scores seemed to be going up slowly. That gap seemed to be narrowing slowly. And this, I was, it seemed to me, and I was assured, this was where things were improving. This was the bright spot in the education system. Middle schools, classrooms were a little rougher, but again, things seemed to be going in the right direction, gradually. But the mystery was this. We go into high school classrooms, rarely, and um, it looked like it all fell apart at high school. I mean, you, there might be several kids with their heads on desks, or there might be very few kids in the classroom because they just didn't bother to show up. And the test scores were also really low, and the gap was really wide. And so I, like many others in the education reform movement, wanted to know, what, 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 why is high school such a problem? And what I essentially stumbled across was that the problems that become so apparent in high school do not begin in high school. And that really what I had been told and what I thought was the bright spot, elementary school, really that was where a lot of the problems that become so apparent in high school begin. And it has to do with the way we teach elementary school. And specifically, you won't be surprised to hear this, the way we teach reading. Now, as you've heard and as you probably know, there are two basic components to reading. There's decoding, which is a set of foundational skills, should be taught as a systematically, explicitly as a set of skills. And then there's the other part of reading, comprehension. And you've probably heard recently a lot more about problems with decoding instruction, of which there are many, than problems with comprehension instruction. But I would argue that the problems with comprehension instruction are, if anything, more pervasive, more widespread, and better hidden than the problems with decoding. And, and much less attention is being brought to bear on them. So what do I mean? Well, let's just look at the standard approach to teaching reading comprehension. Almost any elementary school, it's beginning to change, but almost any elementary school you walk into, um, the first part of this standard approach is that it's teaching reading comprehension skills and strategies. And I won't go into the distinction between skills and strategies. Most teachers, I think, use those terms interchangeably, but there are a whole bunch of them. If you can read this, identify the main idea in details, determine author's purpose, uh, make inferences. And typically, there is like a skill of the week that the teacher will focus on. Um, the teacher will demonstrate this skill of making inferences or finding the main idea or whatever on a book that is chosen not for what it's about, but for how well it seems to lend itself to demonstrating the skill. And then the second part of the theory is that kids will go off and practice the skill on books at their what has been determined to be their individual reading level. So periodically, kids are tested to see what their level is. This is a Fontas and Pinnell chart that has it outdone by you know, A, B, C, but there are other ways of, of designating reading level. And so a kid's reading level could be years below their grade level. You could be a level L, which is second grade, which is a second grade level, but you might be in fifth or sixth grade. And you would be directed to a basket, essentially, of level L books. Um, and again, the books in that basket are not organized by topic. They're on a random bunch of topics, or they might be fiction. They're categorized basically by things like word length and sentence length. And your reading level, if you're a kid, will also be determined by you know, how well you do on a sort of standardized test that doesn't pay any attention to topic. Or, and so the theory of this approach is that if you diligently practice your reading comprehension skills and strategies on books that are essentially easy for you to read, you get really good at finding the main idea, you'll be able to apply that skill to any text that's put in front of you, whether it's a passage on an end of the year standardized reading test or a textbook you'll encounter down the road in high school. So let's test out that theory. 
I'm going to show you a paragraph from a newspaper, and I'm sure you're all expert readers, and I'm just going to ask you to find the main idea. So here goes. I'll give you a minute. Any volunteers? <laughs> Does anybody know what this paragraph is about? Cricket. Cricket, right. Um, and if you're a cricket fan, you'll know what this is describing. You'll have a visual image of it. it it's a piece of cake. If you don't know anything about cricket, it's pretty impenetrable. I mean, you might understand the individual words, but like, what does leg before mean? You know, like, how do you figure this out? Um, well, cognitive scientists, cognitive psychologists in particular, have known about this phenomenon for a long time. Uh, back in the late 1980s, there's something known as the baseball study. How many of you have heard of the baseball study? Pretty many. I'll just briefly explain it for those who don't know about it. So a couple of researchers, wanted, cognitive psychologists, wanted to determine what is more important in reading comprehension. Is it general ability or skill? Or is it knowledge of the topic? And they chose the topic of baseball because they figured there are a lot of kids out there who know a lot about baseball, but they're not generally good readers. And they uh, divided the kids into four groups. These were junior high school students, seventh and eighth graders, according to how much they knew about baseball and how well they had scored on a standardized reading comprehension test. And then they gave them all a passage to read describing a baseball game and tested their comprehension of that passage. And what they found was the kids who knew a lot about baseball all did quite well on that comprehension test when the topic was about baseball. And the kids who didn't know a lot about baseball all did pretty poorly. It didn't matter how well they'd scored on that standardized reading test, really. Um, these two middle bars here, these are the kids who, who were supposedly poor readers but knew a lot about baseball. And these are the kids who were supposedly good readers and didn't know a lot about baseball. So the poor readers scored significantly higher when the topic was baseball. This study has been replicated in numerous other contexts. And what it tells us is a couple of things. Comprehension is not a skill like riding a bike or playing tennis. And if you just keep practicing it, you'll get better and better at it. It's, it depends a lot on how much you know how much knowledge and vocabulary you have about the topic. And secondly, it tells us there's really no such thing as an individual reading level. It's going to depend on the topic and how much you know about it. Um, so this really calls into question that standard approach to reading comprehension. Um, so what does this have to do with testing? Well, t reading passages on tests, like any reading passages, what happens is Authors leave out information that they assume the reader will know, because it would be really tedious to explain every single term. And that's true of passages on reading tests, just as it is of anything else. Um, and, and you know, this may be pretty obvious when we're talking about something like baseball or you know, microbiology. If you don't have a lot of specific knowledge in microbiology and try to read a scholarly article about it, it's going to be tough going. But I think what's less obvious is how much background knowledge and vocabulary a lot of kids lack. Um, and also, well, before I get to that, it's also not so obvious to us as educated adults what knowledge we bring to things we read in newspapers, magazines, to news reports. It's, it, we just kind of take it for granted. So this is just really pretty much chosen at random a paragraph from an op-ed in the New York Times. And I'll just give you a minute to read through that. And while you're reading through it, just think about what is the knowledge you're drawing on to understand this? So, you know, you have to, there's a bunch of things you have to know here, um, that the president has a private capacity and a public capacity. Mostly it has to do with the legal system. You have to know what the Supreme Court is. 
You have to know what an appeal is, what an appeals court is, what a grand jury subpoena is, what a district attorney is, etc. This isn't written for people who've been to law school. I mean, this, this is the knowledge that's assumed on the part of somebody who's reading the New York Times. So now, testing. Um, I'm going to also now show you a paragraph from a standardized reading test that was, whoops, OK, no, not yet. <laughs> testing, as I said, those passages on tests assume a lot of background knowledge. They are not connected to anything kids may have learned in class. They're not supposed to be. They're supposed to be testing these general reading skills. So test designers try to avoid topics that kids might have learned about in class. Um, and it really, you know, you're supposed to be drawing on your general knowledge of the world. Uh, but, you know, if you lack that general knowledge, you're going to be in trouble. Now, Tests, reading tests and math tests be, have become much more important in the last 20 years since the passage of No Child Left Behind. Um, and it's not just the end of the year tests, right? There's testing throughout the year. That testing is not all bad. What it has done is uncovered hidden inequities, previously hidden inequities in our education system. But it hasn't told us how we should address those inequities. And in fact, the way we've tried to address those inequities has, in some cases, had the effect of making those inequities even worse, um, as I will explain. Um, so reading and math have always taken up a lot of the school day, the elementary school day. But what has happened in recent years with the advent of No Child Left Behind and even ESSA, you know, they're still, a very, testing has become very important. It's the yardstick by which we're measuring all educational progress. And because the tests seem to be, or the reading tests seem to be asking kids to demonstrate those same skills that teachers were teaching before, like can you find the main idea, can you make an inference, teachers, educators naturally have thought, oh, that's what we need to focus on. We need more practice on finding the main idea so kids will do better on the tests. And so other subjects, social studies is often the first to go in the arts and to some extent science. Those subjects have been eliminated or at least marginalized from the curriculum, especially in schools where test scores are low. And the problem is that those eliminated subjects are the ones that have the most potential to build the kind of knowledge kids actually need for reading comprehension. So we've been really shooting ourselves in the foot by eliminating those subjects and, and essentially spending the entire school day on reading and math. Um, so now I'm going to show you that passage from a third grade reading test. Um, this is from a common core aligned reading test. Now it used to be reading tests in the elementary grades were mostly, they, they would focus on fiction and, and you know, you'd, you'd talk about setting or whatever. Um, with the advent of the common core, there's been more focus on getting nonfiction into the elementary curriculum and the tests have done likewise. So this passage, I'll give you a minute to read through it, um, is nonfiction. Now, to an educated adult, this paragraph looks pretty straightforward. But now I'm going to show you the same paragraph with the words and phrases blacked out that many third graders will not know. And when it looks like that, it's as pretty much as impenetrable as that cricket paragraph was to, if you don't know about cricket. Now, some third graders will know these words and phrases. They tend to be the third graders who have come from more, edu more highly educated families and have had an opportunity to pick up that kind of knowledge and vocabulary at home. The other kids rely on school for that. And unfortunately, they're the least likely to get that kind of knowledge there. Um, so what does this have to do with high school? Why is it that things seem to fall apart at high school? Well, um, one reason is that, well, I'll get to that other reason in a minute. F firstly, knowledge does not just help you understand what you're reading. It also helps you 
absorb and retain information. The more information you have about a topic, the easier it is to remember the new information you're reading. Um, and it has been said that knowledge is like Velcro. It sticks best to other related knowledge. So what this means um, is when kids start out in kindergarten with more knowledge and vocabulary, they're able to read and understand more complex texts from the get-go. They're also absorbing and retaining more information from that text, which then enables them to read yet more complex text and retain yet more sophisticated information. Which, you know, so it's this virtuous snowballing process. That's virtuous. Meanwhile, the other kids who start out with less knowledge and vocabulary are relegated under our leveled reading system to simpler texts that they can read more, e they can read easily on their own. They're, they have less of an opportunity to absorb and retain information because they're starting, they don't have that other half of the Velcro, and they fall farther and farther behind every year that they stay in school, unless schools are building their knowledge. So this has been called the Matthew effect. You may have heard about this. I mean, it relates to decoding, but also to knowledge. And it means that the longer you wait to start building knowledge, the, the wider that gap gets and the harder it is to narrow. So that's why it's really important to start building knowledge as early as possible while kids are still learning to decode. And you continue to, to do that as time goes by, you don't stop. Um, but there's another kind of knowledge gap that emerges in high school, and that is the difference between what we assume high school students know and what many do know. Now, this narrow curriculum, this focus on reading comprehension skills at the expense of building knowledge, can continue through middle school, often does in schools where test scores are low, because like the test, the test scores aren't going up. We obviously need to spend more time on reading comprehension skills. So that means that kids can get to ninth grade without ever having had any systematic instruction in history, social studies, science, the arts, or much of anything. And I've spent some time in high poverty high schools. But I've also talked to a lot of teachers in high poverty high schools. And they've told me they have had kids at all levels of ability. But they've told me it's not uncommon for kids to come in and even graduate without knowing things like the difference between a city and a state the difference between a city and a country, or a country and a continent, without being able to find the United States on a map of the world, or their hometown on a map of the United States. And they also lack a sense of historical chronology. If you, if you haven't been exposed to the whole concept of history in the past, it's, it's hard to figure that out in high school. And especially if you get textbooks like this, you know, you don't know what Europe is, you don't know that Africa is a continent as opposed to a country, and you get a textbook on world history. This is a very frustrating situation for both students and teachers. Um, so when I stumbled across this problem, and I realized that I, I thought I knew a lot about education, I'd gone to all sorts of expert panel discussions. I had read everything I could get my hands on. I had never heard of this approach to reading comprehension as a problem. I, in fact, I'd been in a lot of elementary school classrooms, and I, hadn't, I realized I hadn't known what I was looking at. I assumed that teachers were trying to build kids' knowledge, where they were trying to teach them social studies, et cetera. And I was, it was only because a veteran educator took me aside and said, actually, <laughs> that's not what's going on, that I realized that this, this was an issue. I wasn't the first to stumble across this problem or uncover it, but what I realized was there was a small group of people very concerned about it, but they were basically just talking to each other. And there had been things written about this, but they were kind of academic and dry. And it seemed to me what was needed was a more narrative, journalistic, engaging approach to this issue that would grab, the, grab public attention, get this into the public conversation about education. And nobody else was writing that book, so I tried to. And I have to say the reaction, the response within the education world has been very gratifying. I think it has yet to really mm -hmm. penetrate beyond the education world, but I'm hoping that will come soon. Um, but I didn't write this book just to describe the problem. I also wanted to know a couple of other things. One, 
where did this come from? Because I can tell you as an outsider in the, to the education world, you know, you see a teacher read a book about whatever, whales, and then instead of talking about whales, she starts talking about the author's purpose. Like, where did that, you know, why would you do that? Um, and what I discovered was that um, this, this approach does have some very deep, indirectly deep roots. Um, I'm sure you've heard of this guy, and I don't want to lay all the sins of modern education at John Dewey's feet, but he is considered the father of the progressive education movement, and one of the central tenets of that movement is that it is better for kids to construct or discover knowledge for themselves than to have somebody stand up in front of them like I'm doing and just pour information into their, the passive receptacles of their brains. Now, there's some truth to that. We all do need to participate in constructing our own knowledge, but there's a difference between that and expecting kids to discover information for themselves, especially when they're starting out with very little information about the world. And that's essentially what we've been asking kids to do. And the way this ties into this com comprehension skills and strategies approach is that teachers can feel like, I'm not just dumping information on these kids and they're going to be bored and they're not going to understand it anyway. Um, I'm giving them the tools that they can use to construct their own knowledge later on. But that's not, it's not really working. Um, now, the more recently, a more recent uh, development that it didn't it start the whole approach, to the skills and strategies approach to reading comprehension, but it had, it seemed to lend the imprimatur of science to it, is the National Reading Panel Report that came out in um, 2000, which identified, I'm sure, as you, as you know, five pillars of early literacy, including comprehension, that fifth pillar. Um, now, what, and, and it did, the report found evidence for certain reading comprehension strategies. They looked at some studies. What they failed to mention was the role of knowledge, the role of background knowledge and comprehension, and the fact that those strategies that they found evidence for only work if you have at least some knowledge, enough knowledge to understand the text, at least at a superficial level, because the strategies that they endorsed basically consists of asking yourself questions about monitoring your comprehension, like how can I relate this to other things I know? If you can't answer those questions, the strategies won't help you. Um, there are a couple of other problems with the National Reading Panel report and how it's been interpreted. One is that most of the things that teachers spend time on, comprehension skills and strategies, were not endorsed by a National Reading Panel and really have no evidence behind them. You know, determining author's purpose, no evidence. Um, lastly, even if you're using one of the strategies that the panel endorsed, you're probably not using it the way the studies were conducted, which was to put a complex text in the foreground and then bring in whatever strategies seem to make sense given that text. What the standard approach is is to put the strategy or often the skill in the foreground and make the content of the text totally secondary. So that is not what was endorsed. That there's no evidence behind that. But this has been very influential. Um, you know, we've heard about how more and more uh, teacher preparation programs are covering the five pillars of early literacy, at least in their, their syllabi. And most, of, I mean, the, the one that is covered the most is comprehension. I think the NCTQ found something like almost 80% of undergraduate programs cover comprehension. That sounds good, but what are they teaching these prospective teachers about comprehension? They're just teaching them, all you have to do is teach skills and strategies. So we can't just say science of reading and, and think, okay, comprehension is taken care of, because if science of reading is defined to mean comprehension teaching equals teaching skills and strategies, that's a huge problem. And what's going to happen is, in high school, when kids can't understand, they may be able to decode what they're reading if they've gotten good decoding instruction, but they won't be able to understand it, and then people will say yet again, oh, you see, phonics doesn't work. So we have to be very careful we're not leaving the knowledge building message behind. So the other question I wanted to answer in writing this book was, what can we do about this problem? Where can we go from here? And the good news is that there is a lot that schools can do, and some are beginning to do, including some here in North Carolina and, and in other places. And um, what it begins with, not, not the only thing, but the first step is adopting one of these new content-focused elementary literacy curricula. 
Um, there, these, none of these existed, you know, 10 years ago or even probably eight years ago. Um, but they have been developed recently. These are the ones that I know something about. There may be a couple more now. Um, and they're all, they all cover different bodies of knowledge in different ways. And you know, some of them will be more appropriate for one school or school district than another. But they all have two basic things in common. One is they're organized by topic rather than skill of the week. Um, and they spend at least a couple of weeks on a topic, not zebras one day, clouds the next, because we're just really learning how to make inferences about clouds and zebras. Um, you've got to spend at least a couple of weeks on a topic to have vocabulary and concepts repeated to give kids a chance to absorb that information and to create knowledge for themselves out of that information. Um, and the other thing they all have in common is they all have teachers reading aloud to the entire class from books or texts that those kids could not read themselves. That's really important for two reasons. One is written language is almost always more complex than spoken language. Um, you know, it's, it's, except for expert witness testimony. Even, even uh, children's books are more complex than adult TV uh, uh, shows. Um, and so kids, if they're going to eventually learn to understand written language on their own, they have to become accustomed to its peculiar syntax and vocabulary and those things. The second important thing is that kids' listening comprehension exceeds their reading comprehension on average through middle school. That means, I mean, you know, that obviously, if you've got a four-year-old, their listening comprehension is going to exceed their reading comprehension. They probably can't read yet, and they can take in more sophisticated <laughs> concepts and vocabulary through listening than through their own reading, even when they're six, seven. But this continues for quite a while when, until they become really fluent readers. And again, it's going to depend on the topic and how complex the text is. But we need to get kids absorbing those concepts and vocabulary through listening so that later on, when they are reading on their own, those concepts, that, that vocabulary will be familiar to them. So one of the other things I did for the book to make it more engaging and journalistic was I followed two classrooms through a school year. One using the standard approach to reading comprehension was a basal reader, and the other using one of the new content-focused uh, elementary literacy curricula. It happened to be core knowledge language arts, which is the oldest of them and was pretty much the only game in town three or four years ago when I started this research. Um, and I, I wish I could show you videos of these two classrooms. They were not identical, because um, no two classrooms are. One was a first grade classroom, one was a second grade classroom. Um, but they, they were pretty similar. They, they were all children from low income families, all children of color. And the teachers in both of these classrooms were hardworking, dedicated, smart teachers. And yet the classrooms were like night and day. Um, the skills-focused classroom, it was really hard to get a classroom discussion going. Um, they, there was very little classroom discussion and very little engagement because the kids really didn't have anything much to say about main idea. What I can show you is um, posters from these classrooms. And the posters in the skills-focused classroom were all about skills. <laughs> They didn't have much to say about you know, captions. What's the difference between a caption and a subtitle? That was the focus of one lesson. The kids all wanted to know, oh, what's going on in that picture? And the teacher deflected those questions because she felt it was her job to teach them the abstract concept of a caption. So she would say, oh, I bet you'd like a caption about that. The, the content-focused classroom was the walls were covered and the windows were covered with posters like this um, that the, the teacher and the students, the second graders, would create together during the daily read aloud. This happens to be from the unit on Greek mythology, which the kids loved, and the myth of Daedalus and Icarus. Um, and they, they would have amazing discussions, these kids, about things like, was Alexander the Great's ambitious nature an inspiration to his followers or a flaw? you know, second graders, and they, they, they were, they had some very perceptive insights into these things. They were also picking up an enormous amount of vocabulary 
through learning. That is the best way to build vocabulary, is through building knowledge. So in, on this poster, for example, you've got vocabulary words like desperately, plummeted, foresight. I had, and, and these kids were using words like this in their conversation. I had lunch with a group of them about midway through the school year, and they were so excited to tell me about all the things they'd been learning. They were so proud of all the knowledge they'd acquired. But what really struck me was the vocabulary they were using, things like revenge, opponent, labyrinth. And these were kids, mostly kids from non-English speaking families. And some of them were still learning English themselves. Now, now these are words they may not encounter on third, fourth, or even fifth grade reading comprehension tests, but those words will be lodged in their long-term memories and will stand them in very good stead in high school and beyond. Um, so I don't want to leave you with the impression, though, that if a kid it gets to high school without having had their knowledge built, that that's too bad. There's nothing you can do in high school. It is harder to compensate for knowledge gaps in high school, but it's not impossible. Um, and the one thing that I've seen work in high school and really at all grade levels to build knowledge is writing instruction. Um, not, not just any writing instruction. Um, now, I think we all know, it's pretty much common sense that n you need some knowledge to write about something. You can't write about a topic you don't know. So that's one connection between knowledge and writing. What may be less obvious is how the writing process itself can build and deepen knowledge and also enhance reading comprehension and analytical abilities. And I don't have time to get into that in depth, but what, why is writing so powerful as a lever for building knowledge, potentially? Well, scientists, unfortunately, haven't studied writing very much, not nearly as much as reading. Um, but they have studied some other things that enter into the writing process. And my, this is my own theory. This is why writing is so powerful. One of those things is what's called retrieval practice, or the testing effect. And as the name indicates, it's been studied mostly in the context of testing or quizzing. But essentially, the, what, it, what it's about is that recalling information that you have slightly forgotten is a powerful boost to retaining that information. So if you quiz yourself, after you've read something, rather than going back and highlighting, that's going to be much more powerful. And we do that when we write. Unless we're just copying something, we have to retrieve information that we've slightly forgotten. The other uh, effect that comes into play with writing is what's been called the protege effect. That has been studied mostly in the context of having one student explain something to another. But the essence of it is that you're explaining something to another person in your own words. And that's, again, what we do when we write. So the combination of these two things is so powerful that it can compensate for that missing half of the Velcro. If you write about something, it gets really cemented in your long-term memory. The caveat here is that writing is the most difficult thing we ask kids to do, I would say. It's certainly more difficult than reading. It's because it's, it's expressive rather than receptive. So it's like the difference between speaking a foreign language and understanding a foreign language. Um, and it imposes, writing imposes huge demands on what's called working memory, which is kind of like short-term memory. If you're an inexperienced writer, you're trying to, the, the important thing to know about working memory is that it only can hold a limited number of things for a limited period of time. And if you're an inexperienced writer, you're juggling all sorts of things, everything from, if you're a kid, real young, you know, letter formation, to spelling, to word choice, to organization, plus whatever the content is you're trying to write about. And that can be so overwhelming that you neither learn to write well, nor do you derive <laughs> those knowledge building benefits from writing, because it's just too much. So what can we do um, to make writing something that actually can build knowledge. We have to modulate that heavy cognitive load that it imposes. And um, so this is another book that I co-authored with a veteran educator, who's the one who actually told me that I, what, what comp reading comprehension instruction actually was look, looked like, um, Judy Hockman. And she did, had developed 
a method, really working with kids with language-based learning disabilities, but it, this works for all kids. She developed a method of writing instruction that does two things. It grounds, that this is, I don't know of any other method that does both of these things, and most writing instruction does neither of these things. It grounds writing instruction in the content of the curriculum, whatever it is you're actually trying to teach. You're, teach, you're not trying to teach about the Civil War, have kids write about the Civil War. Too often we ask kids to write about their trip to the amusement park, or, or there's a separate writing curriculum where they write about whether we should have chocolate milk in the cafeteria. That wastes the knowledge building, the potential knowledge building benefits of writing instruction. Secondly, this method begins at the sentence level. Now, there are two reasons for that. And we, you know, we ask kids even in kindergarten to write at length because we think they need to develop fluency and stamina and voice. But too often, they just never learn how to write. Um, and th there are two reasons to begin at the sentence level. One is that if you can't write a good sentence, as many kids in high school have not yet learned to do, you'll never write a good paragraph or a good essay. But the other reason to begin at the sentence level is to modulate that cognitive load so that free frees up enough cognitive capacity that kids can actually think about the content rather than how do I spell this word or what word should I use or what, whatever. So I won't go into detail about this method, but I just want to give you an example of one of the sentence level activities that it includes. And as I said, this method can be adapted to any subject matter, should be, should be taught across the curriculum, and also any grade level. And you can start this in kindergarten orally and collab collectively. It doesn't have to, you don't have to wait till kids have learned to actually write. Um, but let's say you're a social studies or history teacher and you're teaching about the presidency of Andrew Jackson. So you, this activity is called Because, But, and So. And what it consists of is giving kids, and this has to be carefully planned, by the way, because it could turn into a fill-in-the-blank activity or it can become too vague. But um, you have to carefully construct a sentence stem that kids could fill in in three different ways. Andrew Jackson was a popular president because, but, and so. Each of these sentence stems requires them to retrieve a different kind of information from, that they've slightly forgotten. And but is going to be harder than because, because it calls for co contrasting information. And, um, and then they have to put it into their own words. And here's what you might get. There's no one right answer, but because he was the champion of the common man, but there were many critics of his kitchen cabinet and spoil system, and I can think of some other buts that you might want to put in there. Um, and so, you know, what happened next? So this is just um, a taste of what that method is like. But, um, you know, it, it, it has to begin with curriculum, especially at the elementary level, because too often the problem is you can't use this writing method in elementary school because the kids don't, have not learned enough about any particular topic to be able to write even a few sentences about it that are coherent. Um, so you, you have to, I, I do think the first step, as I said before, is adopting a content-focused curriculum. But that's just the first step. It, 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 this is going to be a very different approach from what most, especially elementary school educators, are used to. And they will need some help and support and coaching uh, to uh, implement it effectively, you know. Um, and I, I would add here that, um, so I don't know how many of you were at the panel last night, but it was about teacher quality and, and how do we improve teacher quality. And, um, and implementation was one of the things that came up. One thing that wasn't mentioned was the importance of curriculum. And um, Kelly showed a slide showing that that was like in John Hattie's schema, that, that was the second most important contributing factor to educational outcomes. But there's also been some research showing it is as important as having an experienced teacher and that the effect of curriculum um, is especially great for new teachers. And we have a lot of new teachers, especially in high poverty schools. Uh, so the other thing about curriculum as a tool for improving educational outcomes is that a good curriculum doesn't cost any more than a bad curriculum. So it's very cost effective. And I've seen and heard, I don't know that there's research on this, but a good curriculum can take a pretty good teacher and make that teacher into a great teacher. 
And by the same token, if you've got a great teacher who's teaching a curriculum that doesn't make sense by the principles of cognitive science, that's actually not giving kids what they need, that greatness is going to be wasted. Um, but the other thing that curriculum could do, we also hear a lot about high expectations. And that's important. Teachers need to have high expectations. But if you've got high expectations and you're not giving kids the tools they need to meet those high expectations, it's going to end in disappointment. And the other thing about curriculum is that it, it can actually change teachers' expectations. Um, so I'll just end with um, an anecdote that I heard when I was researching the book when I was out in Reno, Nevada. Um, and, and there were some, a bunch of schools there who, that had start adopt, started adopting core knowledge language arts instead of the basal reader they'd been using. And there was one teacher who was somewhat skeptical. It was her first year using CKLA. And she thought, you know, don't these kids, kids really need their skills and strategies? And she was giving a standard, standardized reading comprehension test to determine a kid's individual reading level. A little boy who, this was a second grade teacher, and this little boy was struggling like crazy. He was the low end of second grade, and this was way well into the school year. And she saw in the testing kit, there was a text on westward expansion, which happened to be the topic the class had just spent two weeks on. But this text was a fourth grade level text, and this was a struggling second grader. But just out of curiosity, she handed the boy the text, and he read it with 100% comprehension and 98% accuracy. And so she thought, OK, I guess this curriculum maybe does make some sense. But that, that also changed her expectations of what this child was capable of. And it probably changed that kid's expectations and self-concept. And you know, there are untold numbers of teachers and kids out there who are stuck in this false assumption that they're all, these kids are only capable of so much. Um, we need to unlock all of that wasted potential that's out there as soon as possible. So thank you. We have to turn the questions. All right. Now we follow the rules. We have 10 minutes for questions. And actually, I'm going to, um, to switch things up a little bit and have our three additional speakers come on up. And so that if y'all have, think about your questions for Natalie. But if you three ladies can come sit up. Um, so because I bet y'all have, have, once you've gotten some food in you, have had some questions about this morning's earlier presentation as well. Uh, so questions for Natalie to start. Yes, Heather. Hi, Natalie. I have a question for you about the, um, the comment that you made about how the push to focus on reading and math has pushed out science and social studies and art and then the detrimental effect of that. And I wonder if you've looked at other countries and how how they handle that and if there are other examples of places where they're not doing that and they see positive outcomes or other places that are feeling that same push that the U.S. is feeling. Yeah, I mean, I haven't looked at other countries in depth, but I, um, I can tell you that, you know, on international tests, the countries that do better than we do, basically they all have a national curriculum, which we can't have in this country. Um, but they not only have a, a, a national curriculum that is content-focused throughout K through 12, and they have tests that are aligned to that content. So they don't have the kinds of tests we have that are essentially tests of general knowledge. And like it's kind of a crapshoot whether you're going to have that knowledge. Um, so I think th those, that's, that's tremendously important. Um, and there is one, so we can't do that at the national level in this country. But there are, there's a lot that can be done at the state and district level. And one state, Louisiana, um, has developed its own it begins in third grade. I wish it, it began earlier, but they, they've done some other things for the earlier grades. Its own content-focused ELA and social studies curriculum, and they are now experimenting with a pilot that, that they've created a standardized reading test that is actually the topics on that test are grounded in the content of their ELA and social studies curriculum. And that gives teachers an incentive to focus on the content rather than the skills they think are being tested. And it also really helps level the playing field for kids who are not picking up a lot of general knowledge outside school. What else? I have a question. Go ahead. What 
is the, what is the curriculum going to be? And who decides what it's going to be? I think the fear is, is that curriculum going to be inclusive of all students? So yeah. Well, I get that question a lot, as you, you might imagine. And um, I have several answers. But I think you know one, one answer is, first of all, a lot of the knowledge that I'm talking about, like the difference between a city and a state, I mean, nobody owns that knowledge, right? We, we should at least be providing that basic kind of knowledge, and we're not. But also, you know, we do manage to make those decisions about content and what knowledge we should include at the high school level. There's, a, there's no high school in the country that's not supposed to be teaching US history and all of those things. The problem is when kids get there, they don't have the background knowledge to understand those things at the high school level. So if we can make those decisions at the high school level, why can't we do it for the elementary school level as well? Um, and you know, there's, it's true, you know, history, <laughs> knowledge, has be it's become a lot more complicated since I was in school and I only learned about the United States and <laughs> Europe and, and we've really, you know, there's a lot more that we've realized needs to be included. But the good news is if we stop spending so much time on these illusory skills and strategies, we'll open up a lot more time for other things, um, for you know, world history. I mean, it's not like there's some list that you know, every child needs to know X, Y, and Z. There are different bodies of knowledge. And the, the ultimate goal is you've got enough sort of general knowledge. You've got a, you understand the nuances of different words enough that you'll be able to understand whatever text is put in front of you, even if you don't have specific background knowledge of the topic. And there are lots of ways of getting to that point. Um, so I don't think, you know, as I said, all of those different curricula that I showed, they, they cover different pieces of the body of knowledge that's out there. Um, any of them are going to be better than what is currently going on in most elementary school classrooms. But lastly, I would say, you know, we can't uh, let our difficulties deciding on what knowledge be the reason that we deny access to knowledge completely to the kids who need it most. We as adults need to just get up, get over that, <laughs> so that kids are not left, uh, you know, be, being held accountable for knowledge that no one has given them the means to acquire. Okay, Wes? Uh, yes, uh, I work in community college. We work with a lot of adults to get to <laughs> us that can maybe generously be described as marginally literate. Yeah. But they're, in the, they're about to be in the workforce or in the workforce. Will any of these strategies work, or are you aware of any studies of where this same type of thing has been uh, applied with adults? learners and adult students because we would really that's a tremendous need in our state if we're going to train people for the jobs and give them fair yeah. sustaining wages. Well I said you know it's it's not not it's harder to build knowledge or fill in knowledge gaps at high school than in elementary school. And of course it's even harder at the college level and the you know the the approach that I said work had the most promise that I've seen is this across the curriculum kind of writing instruction. It's hard enough to get all high school teachers in a, in a building to sign on to that. But at the college level, where instructors, professors are used to having a lot of autonomy, it's, it's really, I don't know that it can work. So um, I think what I, from what I've seen, what can work is rather than putting kids who, uh, are, are, who need remedial help, rather than putting them in separate remedial reading, and maybe, maybe math is different, but a remedial reading course, un unless it's actually, fo they can't decode, and you, you really need to teach them those decoding skills. But I, you know, if it's just some remedial reading course where they're working on, I don't know what, skills and strategies, I, uh, that's probably not going to help any better at the college level than it does in the elementary level. What can help, I think, from what I've seen um, in terms of evidence, is tutoring. I mean, that's pretty labor intensive, but put them in regular classes and then match them with somebody who can really give them intensive help so they can understand the material that they're supposed to understand for that course. Um, 
Actually, Barksdale is getting ready to do this study in Mississippi. Uh, in fact, we're working with Public Impact um, to help us do this. And uh, in fact, I got the question at lunch about what were we doing next to, to build on and sustain this work. And even though we haven't completely fixed K-3, we do know lots of kids get through the gate uh, and, and get all the way through high school graduation and still aren't reading well enough to do reading and math in college. Um, so we're going to do a study of this to look at what happens after fourth grade and also look at what happens in those developmental ed classes that students are paying tuition dollars for but not getting any credit for. Um, because my hunch is that there are lots of kids there who have issues around decoding and language um, and we're treating it as a comprehension problem. Um, and so stay tuned, I'll have some more statistics. Right now we know that 42% of Mississippi graduates, even though we've increased our graduation rate, 42% of them end up in a developmental class. So. And that's, that's actually not that different than it is nationally. Nationally, a third or so of our students graduate from high school, go on to college, and need some sort of remedial help in reading. And a lot of it, I think, has to do with the, those misconceptions I talked about earlier and what they're being taught. Um, and we do know that if it's a decoding issue, there really aren't any shortcuts. I mean, they really do have to go back through that developmental progression. It's primarily a phonologic deficit area, and it has to be, the gap has to be filled. The good news is, with older students like that, there's, well, there's good news and bad news. The good news is we can remediate that with instruction, because again, instruction is the key here. Uh, the bad news is if they've experienced years and years of failure, then I, I always call failure a bandwidth eater. <laughs> it eats away, it, it, it erodes your bandwidth because you've had this, this kind of perpetual failure. So, but it can be done, if it's a, especially if it's a decoding issue. Uh, Yana, last question. Um, I have a question for you, Natalie. Um, I just came from a school district where we implemented wit and wisdom first year. Our biggest challenge has been um, with our teachers and the shift to teaching that way, to really focusing on the content. So the question is, how do you prepare teachers for that shift? I observed a kindergarten classroom, a veteran kindergarten teacher, and she was talking to five-year-olds about a Socratic seminar. Uh, <laughs> it was amazing to watch. Uh, but when we were leaving out, she said, you know, this is really hard for me, but I'm getting it, and I'm seeing my students benefit from it. But if I could go back, people always ask, we'll say, what would you do differently about anything that we're doing? What would you do differently? It's really trying to prep teachers for this huge shift in how they're used to teaching. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I have a whole <laughs> bunch of slides I sometimes show about that. Um, and I think not so much at the kindergarten level, but one big problem is is that is if teachers are being evaluated on the basis of tests that don't relate to the content that, or if their schools are being evaluated, don't relate to a particular body of knowledge that they're supposed to be teaching, that they're not going to think, well, I really should be spending time on the skills and strategies. That's one problem. But beyond that, um, I think there are three broad sets of obstacles to getting teachers to incorporate really anything new that's based on science into their classroom practice. And one is, you know, intellectual. It's different from every, they may not have ever heard of it before. Everything they've heard of goes against it. So, you know, it's, it's natural to expect resistance on the part of some teachers. And then there, there are emotional factors. Like, I mean, it, you know, if you've been doing something for years and the sincere belief that you're helping kids and somebody comes along and says, you know what, you're not, not only have you not been helping them, you may have been holding them back. That's a very difficult message to hear. And um, one way to people protect themselves against that is something called confirmation bias, which means if you have a deeply held belief and then you're presented with evidence that goes against it, that you're more likely to reject that evidence. And then lastly, I mean, even if you get past those intellectual and emotional obstacles and you really want to do this new way of teaching, teaching is such a complex activity that is very hard, it's, it's hard to remember to do it, essentially. You're juggling so many things, it's easy to revert to longstanding <coughs> habits. And so that just takes time and support. But I would say um, for teachers who are resistant, I mean, first of all, after the first year, it gets easier, right? <laughs> so that's true with anything. But um, you know, teacher, t just 
you can tell teachers that something is research-based or evidence-based, but you know, teachers have heard that a lot about a lot of different things that sometimes are not particularly evidence-based or that don't really work very well. And they may think, oh, those people doing the research are just these people in some ivory tower. They don't really know what it's like in the classroom. I think what can work better than just telling them it's research-based is to talk about student engagement and how students actually really like this approach better, how it makes teachers, eventually it will make your job as a teacher easier. Um, and ideally, if, if you can show them and not just tell them, so if you can find a school that has been doing this approach for a while and doing a good job of it and take teachers there to see it, talk to those teachers who've been doing it for a while. I mean, I've talked to teachers who've had that experience and when they see the teachers really like it, they may say it was really tough the first year, but boy, are we glad we kept with it. The, the students really like it, the parents really like it, and teachers come away saying, we got to do this. Great. Uh, join me in thanking our speakers today. Um, I love that the, that the westward expansion is our backdrop for the conclusion, because um, I've had some of you come up to me and go, this is great. Now what? <laughs> because it feels a little Wild Westy, right? So I'm going to give you a couple ideas. And you're going to have a lot more, and I want to hear them. Um, the first is, hey, we've got this opportunity with the State Board Task Force. No pressure, y'all. But this is a big deal. This is a really big deal. So thank you for the time that you've taken to to learn, to bring your expertise, to really work together with educators across the state to figure out how we can write this ship. Uh, the second is, uh, I heard something about a reading league chapter being formed, Chris. So if that whet your appetite, like yes, come see me afterwards. movement building, you all. We need to have a community where we can continue to have these conversations. Um, the third is uh, we have a lot of teacher prep faculty in the room today, which is awesome. Um, if you have ideas around how we can help engage your fellow faculty around conversations like this more, I know you all are having it, but uh, let me know. Um, I'll be, I, I will be the collector and disseminator of those ideas. You heard it here. Um, and, and we have a lot of district folks in the rooms. What I'll say to you is, this is complex stuff. Don't try and figure it out on your own, right? There are so many folks who are working on this. Um, I have leaned so much on smart people at this table and across the room. Um, make sure that you're reaching out, that you find those experts uh, within and also outside of your district who can help you take a comprehensive view of literacy, not as we heard, God, maybe if we just insert this phonics curriculum, it'll like change the trajectory for our kids, right? So let's, let's make sure that we're drawing on the abundance of research that's out there. Um, and five and beyond, you all let me know what those other ideas are. But there's a lot of so what's for us to, to work on together. Um, this is my Oprah moment of the day where I get to say, each of you get a copy of the Knowledge Gap as you walk out. Um, and Natalie will generously um, sign those books for you all. Um, what I will ask for you is that um, if you can let the State Board Task Force members get in line first and quickly, they have to reconvene at one to get back to work. Um, so if you are not a State Task Force member, please let them go ahead. And um, on behalf of the board and, uh, Belk Foundation board and staff, I just want to thank you for, for being here, for being committed, for being passionate. <laughs>